Um, my name is Tommy Davis, and I'm an angel investor with um, a small portfolio of uh, startups, um, mostly from Nigeria. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today, you know, uh, aside from introducing myself, which I just did, is I'm going to sort of very quickly take you through a framework that I've developed um, over the 30 odd years I've been involved with working with startups, but more recently in the last sort of 10 years, working specifically with startups on the African continent. Then I'm going to take you through investment readiness, okay, and using the poem framework as a lens, exactly answering the questions of what a startup business plan is and should do, um, how you pitch investors. And everybody talks about pitching investors, pitching investors. What happens after that? You know, um, so hopefully take you through that. And the critical part, which I think if you're going down this road, you need to know um, at this stage and at least be aware of so that you know you're prepared because it's a journey for the journey ahead i trust that helps after that i'll be more than happy to, to take questions so please note your questions down punch them down in chat <clears throat> so that my work can sort of make sure i get to them at uh, the end of the workshop and please don't disappear after that we really really want your feedback Okay, we're trying to build a community and we want to know that um, this is what people in the A community really, really need and that it's useful to them so that we can do more of it. And whatever we get wrong, we can also um, make sure that we fix that as uh, we build the community. So um, on that note, Jenny, good to go. Yes, definitely. Um, I just, I'll just say one minute of, of thank you for you as well for making yourself available. You're, you're a big name and I'm sure you know your advice will be so helpful to many young entrepreneurs in our network. And um, yeah, thank you also to TVC Labs for organizing this session. Um, we've run many different surveys over the last few months and, and over the last year um, to basically look into more detail on this issue of access to finance for youth, which really you know, always comes out as one of the big, big topics um, within the community. So this is right on track for, you know, um, our support for young entrepreneurs to, to be more able to access uh, funding for their businesses. And um, yeah, like I said, your household name, and I think um, your advice will be super, super valuable. So thank you for, um, for coming on board today. That yeah, pleasure is mine. And so <clears throat> let's dig in. Now, what is the POEM framework? The POEM framework, it's, it's a simple tool for understanding. Now, I have to put the emphasis on technology-enabled startups. Now, when I say technology-enabled, I'm not talking of technology startups. I'm talking of startups that actually take advantage of the use of technology for business. So that covers a multitude of sins, and it covers just about all the industries I can think of. Uh, when you consider that this particular piece of technology that's in my hand, the mobile phone, is as good as it gets. And, you know, we're talking of a world sort of inside the world being created by those. So for those that are building uh, businesses in that, I we talk about the vision, which is sort of how the it starts with a founder or founders who think about a particular problem in a particular way and find an innovative solution to it. Something somebody hasn't done before, okay? That's what makes it innovative. And they figure a way where, because of the number of people it's gonna have an impact on, it's commercially viable, not the other way around. It's very important to note that difference, okay? It makes money because of impact, not that it's making money to have an impact. So we start, okay, with that in our heads is why would people pay for this? Because it makes their life better. If you don't start from the because it makes their life better, then this is not the framework for you. 
Okay, so I, I trust that you get that. I it sounds subtle, but it's critically important. Okay, in thinking, and everything you think about your business and how your business comes about, if it doesn't start from that vision premise, then this framework's not going to work. But it's just that simple. Now, what then happens if yes, that that is what I believe. I believe that yes, um, that's that that my vision. Uh, can actually generate that way. Well, then we talk about the fact that you have a proposition, which is an offer, and it can be products or service or a combination of both to a target customer base. So you know, or the customers know, and you know them and you, you know, in a specific market. So there's got to be a belong to a specific geography. We talk about Lagos in Nigeria and Africa. Those are three specific markets. Now, for that proposition to come to life, you need an organization, which is a set of people, okay, from the owners to the governors, uh, to the managers, to the founders, um, to the employees who run a set of processes from buying to making to selling, okay, using that technology I talked about earlier to deliver the proposition. Now, the way we measure what they do is economically saying that first of all, they take capital and all of them need capital, whether it's provided by friends and family and a you know, whole bunch of people to fund expenses, okay, that generate revenue, which create the impact we talked about at the beginning. So that's why it works that way. Now, the milestones, are how we tell whether they're getting along the way and growing up as a startup company as we expect them to do, because we measure the targets, we know what the targets should be, how are they achieving those targets and what are the challenges along. So thinking through all of those pieces about your venture is what the POEM framework is all about. It helps you to identify the core strategic areas for developing your startup. Now, I trust that helps. So. I did say I'd break down investment readiness. What do we mean? You know, everybody talks about investment ready, investment ready. What is investment readiness? Well, it's that process of investment, okay, where you're preparing to answer all the hard questions. You know, um, the investors are going to be asking tough questions because, you know, um, you've put yourself out to say, I want to raise money, whether you're raising $25,000 or you're raising $2 million, it's still a process. And that process has some structure to it. And it's essential that you understand that. So first, who are the investors you want to approach? What have they invested in before? Okay. And what are the kind of things they take a shining to? You've got to understand that. And you've also got to be sure that what is expected is what is provided. What do I mean by that? Well, first and foremost, you all know about the traditional pitch deck. I'm going to bring, you know, so I'm not going to bore, uh, bore you with the details of that, but it's, it's as short as it gets a presentation of yourself. I call it the hook. You listen to somebody's pitch deck and you want to hear more. That's the purpose of the pitch deck. The business plan is what tells you the more. Okay, the business now actually breaks a written document that breaks everything down and says, this is how we plan to go about it. This is what we're going to do. If I like that, then we talk about a data room. Now, the data room is where you get analytically retentive, and that's where I expect to see everything from the contract the two of you founders have signed as a co-founders agreement, saying this is how, if we're going to break up, things are going to work out or the contract you signed with an investor that says, okay, it's a safe agreement. This is the cap he gets um, on the future round and this is what the discount are. Don't worry if you don't understand any of that gobbledygook I just said, that's the purpose of this particular session is hopefully to take you through and help you understand. And if not, at least to have the keywords to be able to go on the internet and to other learning environments and empower yourself uh, with the knowledge. Okay, so what's a business plan? All right, because I told you I wasn't gonna talk about pitch deck, it's, it's an abbreviated. It's like I said, a written document, 
for the poem in poem, we talk about the fact that you have to have at least these seven sections. First is the executive summary. I'll talk a bit about that. I talked earlier you about your vision, your proposition, your economics and your milestones. And of course, um, references. And I'll tell you why references are critically important in your business plan. But it's a living set of documents. That's the critical thing to understand. It's not something, oh, you, I've written my business plan. Here it is. Take it. You know, no. It's something you're constantly working with. And it is a set of files that you pick up and aggregate on demand, depending on who needs it for what, but you are constantly running the components of what make up your business plan. And it's based on field research, it's based on you know, desk research, it's based on experiential uh, activities also. So again, it's all focused in this particular instance on how you intend to fund and run your company. So given that, Let's break the business plan down. What's an executive summary? Well, that's the press of your business plan. And guess what? <laughs> Whether you like it or not, everybody's time challenge, it's going to be the most read part of it. So I say, do it first and do it last. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Well, first, you've got to keep it simple and precise. And you write a single sentence. What's, what tells you, you know? Um, TVC Labs finds, funds, and follows entrepreneurs into the future. Hmm, that's nice. No, actually, TVC Labs finds, funds, and follows founders into the future. Oh, yeah, that's what we do. Okay, all right. What do you mean by find? What do you mean by fund? What do you mean by follow? Um, and then that starts to blow it out. Then you summarize making sure we get into the weeds or the details, sorry. I shouldn't say weeds, but let's go. All right, what's your vision? Okay, well, what exactly, you know, first step is what, what exactly, you know, you got this startup idea. What, what, is it, what is the great idea in a simple sentence? What is that? How, you know, do you create the value? Okay, um, how do you expect it to grow? You know, are we going to, everybody tells me, oh, we're going to grow 70% month on month and in 18 years, 18 months, we're going to have a million. What's your story on that? Okay, what are the key things that are going to happen? Okay, um, you've got to be able to encapsulate. Remember, we're trying to document now. This is not just, uh, I can look at the, people in attendance and tell you, this is not just blowing grammar, all right? So you've got to be precise exactly what is the value going to be of the company. Once you know that, then we get to the proposition. Now, this for me is where it gets interesting because you see, you've got to really start to break everything down. This is what defines and distinguishes you from everybody else. It is what excites your customers. It is what is going to convince your investors. So you've got to start first with the problem and the opportunity. Everybody, ah, yeah, it's a $16 trillion. Okay, fantastic. Total addressable market, total obtainable market. What exactly are those sizes? And then what's the solution? No, not the product or service. I said, what's the solution? Why? Because the solution tells me about the market. It tells me about the competition you've got. I'll come down to your product in a second. I want to understand exactly how that market functions. What are the dynamics? Is it in growth? Is it constricting? Okay. What, what are the possibilities of a new entrant actually coming into that market? Then I want to understand the customers. Why? Because they belong to the market. Because if I don't understand market, how can I understand the customers? So break down the customers. What's it going to cost? To, what does it cost to acquire customers? What's their lifetime value? How long are they? You? What makes them up? What are their profiles? What are their demographics? Even the psychographics, if you can get at it and do the surveys, it's just getting out there and understanding. 
And it's the most critical component of building your business is understanding who your customers are and more importantly, why they buy. Once you know that, we can then talk about your business idea and you know the product itself and what the functions and features are gonna be. But let's start with the business model. How are you gonna make money? Right? Oh, it's a subscription. All right, how are they gonna subscribe? Oh no, it's transactional. What percentage are you collecting? How do they pay? When do they pay? How much do they pay? How often do they pay? Let's talk about those things. How often is your product going to be manufactured, created, or consumed? These are all the kind of things we talk about then before we understand the actual functions of each feature and, and what have you. Once we have that picture quite clear, we understand roughly what we call the revenue potential of the proposition. And that's sort of the first pass. Now, given that revenue potential, which organization is going to deliver it? Okay, who are the people? What are the processes? What's the underlying technology? So to do that, well, first of all, give me a breakdown of the ownership. We call it the cap table, if you want to know. How many people have invested in the company and have ownership rights and control? What's the governance structure? Is there a board of directors or a board of advisors or both? What kind of people are on those boards? Who's running the company? Who's the executive team? Is it the founders or is it a different set of people? And what kind of management do they have? Okay, is it managed by objective or management by directive? What kind of style is it? How about the employees? How well compensated, poorly compensated? What's the retention rate of employees? When was the last time somebody took a pulse check to tell how well they're doing? Okay, now we understand that. Let's talk a bit about the organization itself within the ecosystem. Who are the suppliers that supply to it? Who does it sell out to? Who does it buy it from? Who are the partners it works with? Then how about its strategy? How's it approaching the market? What's the game plan? Are there standardized processes and procedures they follow? Are there international standards they adhere to? Are there licenses? What's the marketing like? Is there a brand voice we can recognize? How's that been articulated? What are the channels? Are they used for sales and distribution too, or are they alternate channels? These are the things investors want to understand about what you're doing. Okay, you've got all of that down pat to a science. How do you run operations? What kind of logistics systems do you have in place to ensure all of this is working as it should? And I said earlier, technology, technology, technology. Yes, we all know it's a cloud to mobile world, but what kind of security infrastructure is obtaining on that one? If you're doing payments, how's that infrastructure working out? What else are the nuances that are peculiar to your particular technology environment? These are the things investors want to know. Okay, so now we know how you make money, how you deliver, let's see if it all works economically. Why? Because when you plan it carefully, this is, everybody knows, this is what makes or breaks any startup. And you should be analyzing as soon as possible. What should you be analyzing? What should you be paying attention on? These are the things that <laughs> when you get a TD on your panel or on your case, as uh, maybe one or two people in here have found out before or as one or two people are about to find out, I want to understand what's happening with capital. Oh, you said your uncle gave you a couple of hundred. Who else has given you in family, friends, and fun, fans, capital? How about outsiders, grants, any of those, gifts? What kind of capital have you amassed to finance these operations? Earlier, I talked about customers. What are your customer economics? How much is it costing you to acquire each of those customers? And how much is the lifetime value they're giving you? How much are you making from them? Let's talk about that. Now, given that, let's talk about your revenue model. So we know which channels are waking, making what kind of money. How come some are different to the others? You've got to be able to articulate. What are those differentiators? You've got to be able to articulate. 
Then we talk about your burn rate, AKA cost profile. Where's all the money going? Who's taking what? You know, are you paying for licenses? Are you paying for people? You know, or are you just breaking bread? Where's the cost? How is it managed? What are the mitigations on the risks associated with it? And then what, what's the look ahead saying? Most important on financial projections where most a lot of you miss out is assumptions. I keep asking, you know, half the time, and there are some very savvy entrepreneurs out there, I will give them that, they have their assumptions down pat. But you've got to know what are you assuming is going to happen for your forecast to do what it is. And this obtains to the market. What's happening in the market? I assume. Customer, what's happening with customers? I assume. Okay. Your product or service, I assume. Okay. What's happening with people? I assume. You've got to have the assumptions laid out so we know the basis of the financial projections, not just, oh, we put 10% um, exchange rate and then we put um, an annual um, inflation rate. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get down to the nitty gritty. What's actually happening in the reality construct of the ecosystem in which you're operating. You can't be generic at this rate. We're talking of a business plan that you're going to use to navigate to those objectives. So very, very important. Then we come to social impact. We talked about this starts with impact. So exactly which impact did you say you're starting with again? How are we measuring that? Who's going to measure it? Oh, by the way, how are we doing against those measurements? What are we doing to correct? How's that going to impact everything else we're doing? Now, those are the critical things that need to be addressed in that business plan. I shouldn't need to ask you. You need to document and write it. So, milestones. Why are milestones important? Well, because it tells me where you've been, shows me where you are, so I can get an idea of where you're going. Like I think they said in uh, the good old US, you'll excuse my paraphrasing. It says, if you ain't been where I've been, seen where I've seen what I've seen, how can you know where I'm coming from? Do you dig what I mean? So that's what milestones are, is what have you achieved along the way? What are those bumps on the back in terms of challenges that you've had to overcome to get here? Okay, where are you today? You know, how to pay me a picture of where you are. And I put those assumptions there in terms of your future milestones. I'm assuming if we raise this half a million dollars, we'll get 500,000 customers. And that means we'll be able to have a revenue of $200 million. And then we'll be able to raise another 10 million. What are those assumptions and what are those milestones? That's what an investor is listening for when we talk about a business plan. That's what they expect to read. So you've done all this work. You found all this information. Where did it come from? Why? Oh, because I know my total of general market is going to be 16 trillion in year. Who said that? Oh, and the average costs, you know, of acquisition of customers in this set, who gave you that information? We know for a fact that Reference, reference, reference. The analysis, the plans, the forecasts, the surveys you run. Remember I talked about that earlier. And any reports that have informed your opinion as documented in your business plan and other documents that are relevant. I mean, Ye has amazing resources for you to draw up on this. So I'm quite sure, you know, if you haven't joined, you better be, you know, because that's where you get all the good stuff. Um, that's going to help you out along that way. So how do you pitch investors? Well, keep it simple and manage timing. If it's five minutes, make it five minutes, don't make it seven. Tell your story and stay focused convey the unique value 
if they can, let them experience it firsthand. Clarity on who your customer is, is always important. And like I said earlier, if you can't support your number of claims, don't make them. Okay, don't just tell me, oh, 15,000 people. Yeah, right. How did that come about? Make sure your pitch deck is solid. I chose not to address that in this particular because it's part of investment readiness, but there's so much out there on, on that. It's untrue. But make sure you have a support team. This is not a one-off thing. It's a process. And please, please, please look the part. I won't say more than that. Now, what happens after the pitch? Well, this is the part I wanted to get to is if, if the investor really, really likes and you can get to it, there's something called a term sheet if you're not aware. And a term sheet basically lays out, this is how I'm going to give you my money if I'm going to invest. Whether it's a safe convertible note or straight equity, it'll lay out the terms in General terms, we call offer terms, compliance terms. The shareholding is for equity, okay? For um, convertibles, it will be different. And of course, for safes, it will be different. But by and large, you will always have offer compliance and general terms that apply. And invariably, they're subject to due diligence. Now, remember earlier, I said there were three parts. First part was the pitch deck. Second part was the business plan. Well, this is where the third part kicks in. And when they say subject to due diligence, what happens is due diligence is that investigation, okay, for possible investment. That means the decision's been taken, yeah, we want to invest, but we want to be sure, okay? And there are two types, okay? There's venture capital due diligence, which is more elaborate than what I'm laying out here, but I'm an angel investor. Okay, and the minimum we'd expect is to go through this, look at your people, okay, get to know the founders of the team, their capability and commitment, look at the market, understanding who your competition really is, okay, what you need in the market to succeed, IP rights, do you have any? Um, like I said, if you're a tech company, code review, okay, or license review in some cases, then your budgets and forecasts, what kind of traction do you have whether you like it or not, I'm gonna look for you online. Okay, if you're not on LinkedIn, oops, sorry, I didn't mean that that way, but you get my point. Um, what image do you have? And of course, take a look at your legals to make sure the agreements are in place. So that's that's really what happens is after all that is gone through, then we can talk about writing a check. But you gotta go through all of those hoops and then, your investment ready. Now I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, I went two minutes over the 30 minutes. My apologies for that, but we've now got time for the Q and A, as I promised you, Maiwa. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for that. Questions, please. If you have any questions, please type in chat so we can get to it. Okay, Abola Jomitogo, please. You can unmute yourself. You would like to talk. I, yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi, Tommy. Um, it's, good, it's good to be on the call. And I know I've been following your work for a long time. Um, and my question is around seeking investment, um, either locally or from international sources. So, for example, I, I see that most sometimes founders often try to seek funding from, um, for example, in the you know, venture capitals or angels in the US as opposed to you know, seeking investors locally. Mm -hmm. Are there specific benefits to seeking um, investment locally versus that um, or internationally? And then what are the benefits also? Thank you. Okay. Benefits of local versus international investors. Okay. That's the first question. Any others? Yes, there is one in chat by Kwame. Is the business plan needed for a pre-seed startup? Questions, please. Is a business plan needed? For a pre-seed startup. Uh, 
if you would prefer to speak, no problems. Just raise up your hand so we can. Okay, while while we're waiting for others, let me see if I can address benefits of local versus may i may i continue yes yes please apologies no worries right benefits of local versus international um there are benefits to both okay what you will find is that if you have local investors international investors are more likely to take you seriously depending on who the local investors are. Um, if you have international investors, local investors are likely to take you seriously. However, may consider that you're outside their realm. So there's a sequence that is implied, which is local before international. Um, but it's not always that way and it's not easy. Um, when I say local versus international, I mean those with a physical presence in the country versus those who do not. There are international companies with physical presence. I consider them local. If they can look you in the eyeball and come physically to do due diligence, then they're local to you. That is what we mean by local. Um, <clears throat> in terms of funding, funding is universal now. So I don't see funding as this is local or this is um, international in that respect anymore. Um, where the changes or the differences occur is in jurisdiction of agreements, but that's a totally different discussion. But where you're domiciled as a company will also be of interest to either your international or local. Um, there are local funders who have requested that people be internationally domiciled and there are international funders who have requested that people be locally domiciled. It depends on the context. Let me explain. So for example, so international funders will insist on local domiciliation where there's a licensing requirement by the local authorities because they will require you to have a, that local presence. So for example, if you're a FinTech, you will need to have a local arm um, to be able to obtain some of the licenses that are available through the SEC or the CBN or others. So that's an example of that. The reverse is also true where, for example, you have local investors who are insisting on international because of the nature of the trade that you're doing, where you're exporting um, from a country like Nigeria, and therefore the currency exchange difference management becomes prohibitive and it becomes a challenge. So you're better off with a Delaware uh, organization. So those are more important. Um, the nature of the investors is dependent increasingly on the industry you're in and exactly the problems you're solving. And so the concept of local versus international plays into it that way. I trust that helps. Now, somebody said, do you need pre-seed? Do you need a business plan for pre-seed? Um, my question is very simple. Are you going on the journey or not. If you're going on the journey, you need a business plan from the day you start to think about a business. That's why it's called a business plan. You plan the business. Now, the level of complexity of the plan will increase over time. And that's what makes the difference. But right from day one, you better be able to tell me how you're going to get where you're going or else what's the point? So the answer is yes, you need a business plan. What I've shared with you is what's required for external investors who are the first external investors like angel investors, what they're going to be looking for. Um, your family and friends will probably be a slightly lighter touch, but I'd strongly suggest you still have a, a business plan that you can trust and say, this is where we're going because it's a navigation tool for an entrepreneur. That's what a business plan should be. I trust that helps. Okay, thank you very much. So William Derry raised his hand, please, if you want to speak. Hello. Yes, sir. Good evening. Thank you for uh, joining. Oh, thank you. Can you get Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. How about my question is how about some of us who have all these um um uh, this thing, all these uh, things you have just mentioned in place, like uh, business plans. Um, 
logical framework, and yet we are still having a difficulty to find investors for funding. So what else can we do? Okay, thank you very much. So before you answer that, um, Eitayo, please unmute yourself and ask your questions. Then I'll take the one in chat, then you answer all. Thank, thank you so you. much, Mayowa. Thank you. Um, TD, thank you so much for doing this again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. I am really struggling with valuation conversations with potential investors right now. Um, we, because I'm in the education space, it looks like the standard is like five to seven X um, of our ARR. Um, we kind of feel that we have done well in terms of like proving ourselves revenue and traction. Um, how would you want, how would you recommend that we approach this kind of conversations um, with many of these international investors? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in chat, Ismail Adejan will ask, is it a bad signal if an investor signs a check without due diligence? How long does a typical due diligence period take? As a startup, how long should you wait before moving on after a VC starts due diligence? So, sir, please answer this question before we go to the others. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, first question was, I'm all documented, but I can't find investors. Well, you're not alone. That's exactly why we created the Lagos Angel Network and uh south southeast angel network abuja angel network rising tide africa but it's still not enough we just don't have enough people okay who understand the space not that they don't care trust me they're building houses they're spending money they're investing but we need more people to help them understand that look oh, here's here's the thing if once you've got a tenant and this is my pitch to investors once you've got a tenant and you're collecting rent, then you have enough money to invest in a startup. But to do that, you need to understand what it takes to invest. And giving somebody $20,000 or $30,000, and you're not going to see that money again for five, maybe seven, or even 10 years. Yes, it'll come back as 300000 or 500000 at that time. But what happens in between? You've got to educate people so they understand traction, they understand growth, they understand Series A, they understand, you know, how funding occurs to build up startups from zero to pay stack, okay, or from zero to flutter wave or from zero to PAGA, okay. Um, but that's education and we've been working on it now for 10 years and we continue to work on it. So I'm sorry, you know, I don't have a straightforward answer to that. What I'd suggest is take a look at the grant schemes available through development partners. There's a lot going on out there. Increasingly, we're finding that family offices are also coming to the rescue, um, especially if you have a social impact story that is credible and measurable, then increasingly you'll find funding. Um, on valuation, well, hmm. uh, valuation is a matter of what buy and seller. And currently, the markets are washed with cash, so we're seeing increase in valuation, but in specific sectors, as you pointed out. So if you're FinTech, you're red hot. If you're EduTech, mm. uh, if you're Logistics, you're red hot. If you're Health Tech, mm. so it, it depends on the time and season. And valuation isn't cast in stone. It depends on, one, who the investors are, two, what stage they're investing in, three, what's gone on before. And a lot of people don't understand about what's gone on before. If you've got a messy cap table with lots and lots of investors and you're still at about $1 million, $2 million valuation, you're going to struggle. So there's an art to the ecosystem and how the money works, excuse me, in terms of it. But yeah, you are right. You're looking at the right numbers. Your ARR is important and what multiple of that you can get is a good start point. But then um, you might want to look up a few methods in terms of valuation methods to add to your repertoire in addition to the VC method, you know, um, and others. Uh, if you ask my one nicely, I think I've got a paper, uh, a, set, a slide deck on valuation that may be useful. I trust that helps. Now, if somebody signs a check to you for over $25,000 without due diligence or not even asking uh, 
for your driver's license. I have a challenge with that because there are legal KYC, anti-money money laundering regulations that abide to us all. So I'd be very, very careful about source of funds. Okay, you could be asked at some future date. That's my answer to that one. Um, I think. Yes, we have Apollo Jomito go again. He's raised his hand. Okay. So go ahead. Yeah, for me, I think I, I, sent, I sent this message to you earlier. Um, so I was just curious, how can we get a meeting, for example, with TVC or its partners or associates? Um, in case you're looking to, you know, pitch your some. Um, your, if you're your, raising your, over um, a million dollars, if you're raising a million dollars, anything over half a million is beyond TVC Labs. We're quite mm -hmm. clear and very focused on our scope. We're very early stage. We take on mm -hmm. people who are starting pre-revenue where we mentor them. And then we do advisory only to that half a million dollar. By the time you're at that stage, we believe that they're VCs and others who are better competent and have access to deeper funding than we do. Um, so that's why we don't engage at that level. Um, so does, some of the people in the audience will tell you. Um, yeah. But what we can do at my world do is we'll be more than happy to sort of point you at some of the VCs operating in the space. We have partners um, like uh, Ingressive. We have um, quite a number of them. Um, um, Alethea Capital just caused a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Voltron, uh, there's Future Africa, there's Ventures Platform, um, just to name a few. Yes. Um, so I guess a follow-up question to that is um, then would a TVC, um, you know, participate in uh, in rounds, for example, if, for example, the company is raising a million dollars, right? Um, no. Does, so you let no. lead the round. Anything about half a million, above half a million, we will not touch. All right, that makes sense. We're small cap and we stay that way. We, you know, maybe when the Naira, in fact, the Naira is just going to get worse. So um, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, half a million is where we, we draw the line um, as an organization because we feel then we can participate actively. Okay. And because what we bring isn't the cash. What we bring is the fact that we've got this network of experts, including TD, Biola Labi you know, mm -hmm. Gerard, you know, and a whole bunch of others um, to the table for, for the, um, for the startup. Once you're raising a million, two million, you know, what have you, then people like Tokumbo Ishmael, um, people like um, <clears throat> Olumide Shoyombo and others are, are better placed, you know, to have those conversations. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. We'd like to follow up later on um, maybe um, a meeting after after whenever you may be comfortable or available. Sorry? I said we'd like to follow up with a, um, with a meeting later on if you uh, whenever you're available to have some of this. Not to raise a million dollars. That's what I'm saying. I'm pointing you at somebody else. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. because you're raising over our threshold, you know, we reserve the time for people who are within our cash man. We don't mean it rudely. It's just there are others who need that time. And we believe it will be of more value spending it with them now, with those who are beyond what we're doing right now, we don't want to waste anybody's time, including ours. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, from Oduayo, whoa, he has a lot of questions. Thanks, CD. very clear. I wish we can do a rerun so we can get more people to get this basic knowledge. Question number one, please, can you share any ideas on how to determine the psychographics of your customers? Question two, what are the chances of a startup getting an investor if it has no strong underlying technology? Number three, shed more light on bond rates. And question number four, please clarify the difference between safe and equity agreements. Whoa, that's another masterclass entirely. <laughs> okay. Number one, psychographics of your customers, simple, you ask them, okay? It's, it's, there's no other way, all right, than because if you want to know your customer, you ask questions and treat your customers your friends. That's why you've got to know them better than anybody else. Uh, people wonder why I spend so much time with founders. That's exactly why. Because then I get to talk to them. I can tell you about founders. Why? Because I spend a lot of time with founders. 
that's it. There's no shortcut, you know, and Jeff Bezos puts it quite nicely. If you go and look, I think I retweeted something to that effect. He says exactly the same thing. Okay, so that, that's how you determine the psychographics. Yeah, you can, their methods, their measurement mechanisms and all of that. But by and large, it's about you understanding who they are and what drives them, what motivates them and what keeps them up at night, what, you know, gets them up from bed in the morning. Those are the things you need to understand. And the only way to do that is understand them, study them. If you want to know how deeply and anally retentive we got when I was a sapient, for example, we had user experience design. We would actually have people wear cameras 24 seven so we could see everything they were doing so we could understand their life habits. That's how deep you can get. So if you look at some of the sites I built like Opodo, okay, which is uh, an online travel site, that's exactly what, because we went through what is that psychology of buying an airline ticket and what does it mean, et cetera. So you've got to understand and measure it that way. I trust that helps. What are the chances of a startup getting an investor if it has no strength, no strong underlying technology? Technology is not the key, okay? Innovation, social impact, okay, and revenue are the keys. So technology is an enabler, don't, you know, unless you're in the technology business. But as I spoke of it, remember I said technology enabled, it's an enabler and it doesn't have to have the strength. It's actually what would the proposition strength is not in the technology. The proposition strength is in the customer impact. If you really want to measure it, you know, what kind of impact are you going to have on your customer base is what's going to determine your revenue generation capability. The reason our Amazon's a bear moth is be simple. You know, we love the fact that we can get what we want almost immediately. Everybody wants that, everybody likes it. If you can deliver it, there yeah, you got it. Okay, Facebook, oh, I like to talk to my friends, etc. So again, it's about that. The impact you can have to make people's lives better. Right. Um, so if you can have that, then yes, you don't need strong technology. But I was speaking specifically of TD in my case, because my background is technology and I can help with technology. I don't know of too many over 60 year old Nigerians who know the difference between HTML and Python or can tell you, you know, um, whether or not uh, this particular AI is, um, you know, <laughs> running genetic algorithms or if it's running others. So again, it, it, it depends on what it is that investor is interested in. And that's why I said, the first thing I said is try to understand where your investors have invested before. Not everybody's investing in tech, okay? Because tech's not the only thing making money. There are tons of places to make money, right? Please shed more light on burn rate. Burn rate is simply the total expenses you are expending as a, comp as a company on a monthly basis. That's how much you're burning. It came to be because, remember I said you actually gather capital? Well, you gather capital and you keep burning that capital on expenses until revenue kicks in. That's what happens, okay? Because you can't replenish the capital until you get revenue. So that's why they call it burning. It's like burning money. Because if you never get to revenue, then is burnt. So that's that's where burn rate came from. But it's the monthly expenses, total expenses that is going out of your pocket on a monthly basis. That's your burn rate. I trust that helps. Please clarify the difference between safe and equity agreement. Safe is a simple agreement for future equity. I think it says it all. <laughs> okay. So safe says, you know what, I'll take your money. Sometime in the future, I'll give you equity, okay? Whereas equity says, uh, right now, cash, and I take shares. Not shares in the future, shares today. Uh -huh. So I trust that helps. Yes, sir. Okay, TD, does TVC Labs invest in social enterprise? Another question, does, TV La does TVC Labs accept startups from Ghana. The last question in chat is, oh no, not the last question. What advice can you give an entrepreneur to help them avoid being tricked by shady investors? 
<laughs> and also, what path would you advise a founder to pursue, given challenges of raising funds locally? One, continue burning funds rightly with the hope of raising next round. Two, focus on profitability and grow organically. So please answer these questions. All right, does TVC Labs do what? Invest in social enterprise. Social enterprise. <laughs> um, my first three investments were called the three S's. The first, most of well, some of you may have heard about, it's now a Disney property called uh, Super Strikers. The second was, oh, sorry, is a company and that created essentially the pharmacovigilance industry. It's a social enterprise called Sproxil. And the third was an e-commerce platform called Slim Trader. Slim Trader no longer exists. Sproxil operates in five, six countries uh, currently and is raising a series C round. And um, as I said earlier, Striker um, is, now belongs to Disney India. So the answer, it's a long-winded answer to say, yes, we do, because that is our genesis. That's where we started from. And currently, our social enterprise uh, of the year for me in my portfolio is a company called Power Stove, which is run by a gentleman called OKSA. What Power Stove do is they manufacture stoves for bottom of the pyramid women that use pellets that are you know, carbon positive. So we find that as the women use the stoves, they're actually enhancing the carbon foot footprint uh, of the world, meaning that we can do carbon trading um, right here from right here in Nigeria. So I trust that helps for that answer. Um, the second uh, was uh, Ghana. Well, TVC Labs, <clears throat> as you've heard me, we like to scope. I'd, I'd scope myself as TVC Labs started out as a, me, I'm just a Lagos boy and I'm just trying to give back to the city that nurtured me because I'm an Omoeku. But then COVID struck. And of course, the mentoring went across Nigeria as opposed to just being Omoeku. So we got people from Kanu and from, um, it's one I'd have to take away and Maiwa would have to present to her board if it's something she wants to do. It's not a decision for me to take, it's one for Maiwa and her team to take as to exactly <laughs> what they're doing. Um, they've come with yay and um, we're happy to support. So I trust that helps. On shady investors, well, they're shady startups too. What can I tell you? Do your due diligence. And by the way, if as a founder, you don't have due diligence for founders, I hope I've shared with you today that you need to do that. What have they invested in before? Are they on LinkedIn? Who knows them? It's the same questions. Because they're waving a check at you doesn't mean you don't know. You know you've got to know your customers, whether they're investors or not. So that's my answer to that one. <clears throat> on the fundraising challenge, um, I have a friend. Uh, I tell him he's going to be knighted soon, but um, he's got so many letters behind his name. But his name is Tommy Lube, I-L-U-B-E. -E. You might want to look him up. He's one of my inspirations because I was at a talk once and Tom said, you know, um, somebody, he's one of the most prolific fundraisers we have. He's raised more money than anybody I know of. Uh, you know, all these guys talking grammar. Anyway, look him up, Tommy Lube. How did you do? He said, so I said, well, every time I start or I take on any founder to support for funding, or I'm funding an idea myself. I said to myself, when I get to 250 no's, when 250 people have told me no, then I'll stop looking for funding. But until then, I'll keep going. So I said, 250. Ah. What's the worst thing he says? Well, there was one that I got to 189. Now, Imagine believing in yourself to the point where you pitch 189 times before somebody says, I'll give you the money. I trust that answers the question. 
Okay, sir. Is non-profit considered a startup? And can it be considered for venture capital? Also, another question is, is TVC Labs willing to work with a green consulting firm that helps startups to raise funding? Okay, um, is non-profit a startup and can it be considered for venture capital? The answer is no. Big, red, no. Okay, for profit, for returns. That's why it's called venture. No return, no venture. Is TVC Labs willing to work with a growing consulting firm that helps startups to raise funding? That's a question for Maya, not for me. Any others? Maya, over to you. Okay, we don't have any other question in the chats. If you have any question, oh, okay, there's one. Does TVC fund international LPs? No, I don't do trading <laughs> under any circumstances. I once lost when I was in my teens and um, I was trying to become a, well, a mogul. Um, I did LPO funding and uh, made a packet then lost a shirt. So we won't go into that. Okay. Trading so, is not, so I believe in innovation, you must create value. If you're not creating value, then you know there isn't any point. And I think we've just come to the end of this. I would like to thank everybody who's been a part of this. I hope you found the information useful. Uh, Myowa can be reached at myowa.ojuri at tvcng.com. Please post all further questions to her by email. And um, Jenny, uh, do you want to have? A lot yes. word. Yes, she will. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate you for taking out the time during this festive period. Thank you so much. And we You're hope welcome. everybody and we hope everybody here enjoyed the session. If you have any more questions, I put my email address in chat so you can reach out to me. We can talk more. Jenny. Yes, um, thank you so much. I won't take much more time. I know we're already a few minutes over, but uh, thanks so much, TD. This was really like so candidly, you shared all the insights on all the different components. Um, this was also the most questions I've ever seen come in um, or like part of the most questions that I've ever seen come in um, throughout all of our sessions across all the chapters. So that's a really good sign. Um, and yeah, I just think this was a super great end, um, end of year event to the Ye chapter that we've now, you know, revived in um, Nigeria together with TVC Labs. And we're really, really happy to have you um, as such an integral part of the community um, and on the platform and to have these monthly events specifically for the community in Nigeria. So thanks a lot for being part of that and happy holidays to everyone. Oh, please, before everybody leaves, Shay will be dropping. Uh, feedback form in chat please please it would take just two minutes of your time please help us so that we know what to do next time for you thank you very anybody much. that Before if we i see your email address in 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 chat i will connect to you okay so if i see your email address on the form that is please fill the feedback if I see it on the feedback list, she is going to draw up a list of all the people that we get feedback from. Those are the people we will connect to because we will know that, yes, you have us in mind too. Okay, so please, please give the feedback so we can engage as a community. If you want to talk to TD, please give us the feedback we need to make that happen. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful holiday, everybody. Thank you. Thanks all. Happy holidays.